Hi everyone. So I spent a lot of my youth hanging out in arcades, rooms that looked a lot like this, and my favorite game at these arcades was Dance Dance Revolution. The idea with Dance Dance Revolution is that it's a rhythm game where arrows come up and those arrows correspond to floor panels that you step on to the beat of the music. And I had a lot of fun with this game. I spent many years playing it. I got pretty good. But arcades started closing, right? This isn't really a thing that exists that much anymore. And for a long time, this made me kind of sad because there's this whole culture that just kind of disappeared. And rhythm games don't really make sense without the required hardware for them. Happily, virtual reality brought in its own solution. This is a game called Beat Saber. The idea is that you wear a VR headset and in this digital environment, blocks come at you. Those blocks have arrows and they're timed to music and each of your controllers become lightsabers and you hit these blocks with the lightsabers. And like Dance Dance Revolution, it comes in a variety of styles and difficulties and it's really a pretty good workout and a pretty fun game. This is what it looks like from within the headset, right? You have these two controllers that are just floating in space. I think something that surprises people about it is that the blocks aren't placed randomly or procedurally. Someone actually has to take the time and choreograph them. And it's really more art than science. There's a lot of very funky songs that are good because they have blocks placed in just the right way. When you buy Beat Saber, it comes with like 15, 20 songs, which given that there are multiple difficulties for each song and every difficulty has its own block arrangement and each block arrangement can take many, many hours to produce, this is a pretty decent amount of songs. But it's also not that many when it comes to you playing this game for hours a day for a sustained amount of time. You get sick of the music it comes with pretty quickly. Happily, the modding community has stepped in, and they've created custom arrangements, custom choreographies, which are commonly called maps. And there's a whole bunch of these. They exist in all genres and styles. Every day, people upload dozens of them. And this is just one website, Beat Saver, that has a whole bunch. So you discover this and you think, oh goodness, I'm never going to run out of music again. This is wonderful, right? There's going to be this endless supply of amazing songs to slash blocks to. And the trouble is that you pretty quickly you realize that most of these maps are no good. That it's actually really hard to make a good map. And most people just download the software, give it a shot, and give up on it. So then I thought, why don't I make my own maps, right? I can choose the songs that I want. I can invest the time in becoming good at it and then give myself an endless supply. But the trouble is that the software you use to make these maps, I wasn't a huge fan of it. So this is what it looks like. This is a screenshot from the creation screen. It's called Mediocre Mapper. As you can tell, it's like very memed up and not very serious. And there's a number of other problems with it. So for example, the first thing is that it's a Windows only piece of software and I only owned Macs at the time. Um, installation is, you need all these dependencies and there's all these sub steps. The dependencies try to install adware on your computer and the usability leaves a lot to be desired. So for example, when you download and install this software, the first thing you have to do is create a new song. So you go through and you fill in the steps, right? Like the name of the song, the artist, all of that. Then you have to create a difficulty. So you click this add difficulty button and it pops up with this whole other menu. It's also not clear, like, how do I start, right? What do I click? But eventually I saw there's this edit level button. So you press edit level and you get this error message. Your audio file name is wrong. Enter only the name, not the path. So then you figure, okay, well, hold on. I put the audio file name over here. It is just uh, a song. It may be hard to read, but it just says song.ogg. So it's not a path. So I tried, I checked and double checked and triple checked that it was the right file name in the right space. But I checked that it had the right song folder. I spent all this time and what I eventually learned is that this is the error message that is shown if anything is wrong. <laughs> it has one error message for all possible errors. And the problem in my case is this right here, this difficulty none. Even though it says that this is an easy difficulty, and even though it doesn't default to one, um, it defaults to none, and you have to infer that that is the problem from this error message. Once you actually get through the gauntlet of creating a song, the editing experience is all right. A lot of people really like it and I don't want to poo poo it too hard. I just wasn't a huge fan. So this is what it looks like. You have this four by three grid. You can scroll and play songs, place blocks by clicking and dragging. You can copy and paste things. Uh, it works all right. But as I mentioned, it was Windows only and it doesn't even work in bootcamp, right? I went through the trouble of installing Windows on my Mac and I still couldn't get it to work. So I thought to myself, there has to be a better way. I'm a developer, I should be able to solve for this problem. What if I create my own editor using React? So this talk, and I thank you for patiently listening through all of this backstory, 
is called Rejecting Bongo Kittens, Achieving 3D Blooms, and Other Lessons Learned. And it's the story of how I created a Beat Saber editor. My name is Josh Como. You can find me on Twitter at this URL. I'm a staff software engineer at Gatsby. I also recently started a new blog, so I encourage you to check it out if you like tutorials on React and Gatsby and CSS. I have a whole bunch of blog posts. So I guess I'll start by showing what this application is and what it does. So this is the primary edit view. And if you hold shift, you can move around and look around with the mouse. If you press space, it plays the song that you have. You can actually place new blocks by clicking and dragging in a direction. And you can use keyboard shortcuts to change colors. Each color corresponds to a different saber because you have, a, in this case, a red one in your left hand and a purple one in your right. It has a waveform along the bottom you can quickly use to scrub through your song. You can place obstacles, which are things that you have to avoid with your head. There's lots of other little improvements and quality of life things, but this is the gist of it. It's a thing you use to place blocks to music so that you can download that file and play it in Beat Saber in your headset. All right, let's go back to the talk. So the cool thing about this is that it's foundationally a React application. And even if you've never worked in 3D, I expect that for most folks, if you have experience with React, you'd be able to get up and moving pretty quickly, uh, which I think is pretty remarkable. It's a testament to the tools that I've used for this, uh, and those are tools we're going to talk about. So we should start by talking a little bit about how 3D graphics work. And the way that this all works, the technology that this is based on is called WebGL. And WebGL is an implementation of OpenGL, which is a very low-level graphics language that runs on the video card. Just to give you an example, um, this is an example of a hello world in vanilla WebGL. And we're not going to go through this code line by line. Frankly, I don't understand most of this code. But I want to give you all a sense of scale for how much code is required to work in vanilla WebGL. I'm still going, right? So this is 172 lines of code. Um, visualize another way. Here's what it looks like in terms of a GitHub GitHub file. And this would be something this would be okay if this was like a whole game or like a really intricate animated thing, but this is the code you need to draw a pink two-dimensional triangle. So it's a lot of code and a lot of trouble and a lot of very low-level principles that you need to understand to do even something pretty minimal like this triangle. So thankfully, we don't have to do this because there's a library called 3.js. And 3.js is a wrapper that makes WebGL much nicer and much more manageable by giving you a much higher level of abstraction to work within. Here's a hello world for a slightly different program, um, but one that I think is pretty cool. So first we have to create a scene. A scene is just a collection of objects in the environment. We need a camera, and there's different kinds of cameras. Here we're going with a perspective camera so that things that are further away appear smaller like they do in real life. What's cool is that you can position things, and this applies to the camera, but also other kinds of things, by just setting properties. So here I'm setting position.z to four. So I'm moving the thing four units, moving the camera, four units out of the monitor towards the user, because you have your x-axis, your y-axis, and your z is, you know, the 3D axis. Positive values go away from the monitors, negative values will go further into it. Next we have a renderer, so we're saying that we want to use the WebGL renderer. I don't know, I wouldn't trust any of the other ones. And then you have some code to initialize it. So we're setting its size and its default color. Then we're pushing it into the DOM. Here we're, here's where it starts to get fun. We're going to create a new box geometry, which is one length by one width by one depth. And we need two things in order to have a shape in 3.js. We need a geometry, which is the kind of the shape of the thing, right? The skeleton. Then we also need a material, which is the skin of it, the texture. And in this case, I'm going to use the standard material and give it a color. You combine a geometry and a material with a mesh, and that is what you need to do to create an object, right? You need both of those constituent pieces. And then we can add that object, in this case a cube, to our scene. Next, we need some lighting, because by default, there isn't any lighting, so everything would be all dark, we wouldn't be able to see anything. So I'm going to create an ambient light, which kind of just lights everything evenly, and then a directional light, which is going to start by default shining down from the top. I'm going to add both of our lights to our scene, and then we have our render loop. So you'll notice I have this function render, and then it's calling it recursively with request animation frame. This just means that this render loop is going to fire roughly 60 times a second if possible. In this loop, I'm going to set the rotation of this cube to increment on both x and y axes, and then I'm going to call renderer.render, .render, passing it the scene and the camera. So this is the line that takes all the stuff we've done up until this point and paints it to the screen. And we're going to do that 60 times a second. Because like with vanilla 2D canvas, it works by you painting to the screen every frame. If 
Finally, we call our render, and then we have this cool little demo. So here what we've done is we've created a cube. You'll notice as it spins, there's light refracting off of it in an interesting way. Uh, you can do something similar to this in CSS where you can create a six-sided cube, but it's not gonna have the same lighting that it would because it's not actually a real 3D texture. Whereas here, it's a full 3D environment. And this is like a hello world example, but people can do some pretty wild things. So here's an example of something someone built with 3JS. This is a demo of a shader editor. It's not too important what that is, but I just think it's amazing that you have this person. There's all of this like rich lighting and shadow work. And then this is just the example of this cool editor, which I don't actually really know much about shaders. It's some sort of low level 3D thing. Thankfully, I am saved from having to learn that by the tools that we're gonna talk about. But I just think this is amazing. I just actually had fun tweaking these numbers and seeing what they did. But what's amazing about this is that this is all running in the browser using JavaScript that isn't too much scarier than the JavaScript we already know. I also, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention this amazing portfolio site by Bruno Simon. So the idea is that this uses 3JS and rather than just have a list of websites in that, you have this little car and you can drive it around with the arrow keys. There's a, a boost, there's like mini games, which, oh no, have I broken my car? Come on car. Oh, there we are, save the day. Yeah, I, I could play with this all day, but I have a talk to give, so I won't. So that's 3JS, and 3JS is a vanilla JavaScript tool. It doesn't help us in React because there's still a missing link there. But thankfully, Paul, who spoke earlier today, for those who are watching this talk uh, alongside the others, um, he's the creator of this tool called React 3 Fiber. And React 3 Fiber is a React renderer for 3JS. What's really cool about this is that React 3 Fiber is a custom renderer. So it's not just that it gives you a bunch of components that correspond to 3JS things. It's a whole new renderer. And by renderer, I mean in the same way that React DOM is a renderer for web and React Native is a renderer for mobile. React DOM has these primitives that we've all seen like div and h1, but React 3 Fiber is different renderer, has different primitives. So the primitives are the things that we saw in 3JS like box geometry and ambient light. And this really makes life Really nice, as we'll see. So here's our final hello world of the talk, this time using React 3 Fiber. We first start by importing a canvas, which is what kickstarts that renderer, as well as this use frame hook from React 3 Fiber. I'm gonna create a component for a box, and a box is just gonna be kind of a cube, a 3D shape. Right now it doesn't have any props, but you could imagine if we wanted to customize this component, we could use whatever props we want. So I'm gonna set some new state to control the box's rotation. It's gonna have an X and a Y that both start at zero. Use frame is a way to hook into that render loop that we saw in that first 3JS hello world. So by default, React 3 Fiber is gonna set up this loop, and this is a way for us to run some code on every frame. And in that frame, I'm going to set the state to increase the box rotation. Same thing that we saw in the 3JS hello world. Then I'm going to return a mesh. That mesh is going to have the rotation and as we saw, a mesh is a combination of a geometry and a material. In this case, the geometry is going to be a box geometry. And like before, it's going to have a length, width, and depth all of one. And then I'm gonna use the same standard material using the color that we saw before. So that's our entire box component. And then we're going to render this box component in our app component. Canvas is that other thing we imported from React 3 Fiber. It's the wrapper for this new renderer. And it's going to render an instance of our box as well as our two lights. And that's it. All of that uh, creates the same spinning box animation that we saw before in only 50 lines of code. Okay, so let's dig into this a little bit deeper. We have this canvas component, and this actually does a bunch of stuff for us. It creates a default scene, a default camera, a default renderer, and it uses a canvas element that it's gonna put into our DOM. And of course, all of these things are customizable. It just chooses sensible defaults. My experience, I haven't needed to tweak them too much. There's also this concept of attaching, and we saw this in the code, but I didn't really go into it. The way that it works is that a mesh needs both a geometry and a material, and it uses this attach prop to do that. So when you're rendering something as children to the mesh, you specify how it should attach. So in this case, the box geometry attaches to the geometry and the material, in this case, a fong material attaches as a material. It's also just really cool that we can leverage the React lifecycle because we already have this whole idea of components mounting and unmounting and React 3 Fiber does all the cleanup for us. We don't have to worry about removing items it makes a lot of problems go away, and it's a really nice developer experience. So React 3 Fiber is a pretty new library. It hasn't existed anywhere near as long as 3JS. 
but it's already being used for a bunch of really compelling things. And this is something I saw on Twitter recently. It's uh, Shopify has this new shop application and they have this cute little 3D spinning globe with clouds. And it's all about the community impact of the app built using React 3 Fiber within React Native, which is super cool. All right, so I wanna to detour a little bit and talk about community because I built this editor for myself, right? I had a problem that I wanted to solve. I wasn't happy with the existing solution, but even though I built it for myself, I wound up being pretty proud of what I created and I wanted to help other people that were also frustrated with the existing editors. So I joined, there's this Discord that all the modders use and all the people that are involved in this community and I started sharing it and immediately I started getting a lot of feedback. You know, I think there's this attitude that if you release something, it must be perfect. And if anyone has any problems with the thing that you release, it is your duty to solve those problems for them. Right, so I started getting bug reports with the idea, not just that it's a bug report to help me fix a bug, but it is my job now to fix this bug for this person. And this of course is not a new problem, right? This is something that we see a lot in open source, just in general. People expect customer support even when they're not paying for customer support. In addition to uh, support requests, I also started getting a lot of feature requests. And it's funny, the most popular request that I got, despite getting like many, many requests, was for Bongo Cat. So this is, I don't know, some meme. I don't know the origins of this meme with the cat. But the reason this kept coming up is that Mediocre Mapper, the mapper I mentioned earlier, has this mode, this Bongo Cat mode, where the blocks become cats. And as you play the song, the little cat does the thing. So, you know, this is a popular feature of an existing editor. By far the most common request I got was for this. The thing is I like cats, like I am a cat person, but I didn't implement this feature because so much of the existing editor is set up around this meme subculture and that's fine, right? Like that's, it's okay for this thing to embrace a culture, but it wound up really producing this Reddit vibe. And I don't mean to say anything bad about the culture because of course, like there were some bad experiences, some bad people, but for the most part, this community is full of wonderful people. And I don't blame them for wanting an editor that fits into their vibe. It's just that I wanted to build an editor that would be welcoming and friendly for other kinds of people, right? People that don't spend all their time on Reddit that aren't immersed in this subculture. And maybe because of that, user growth was pretty flat. It wasn't really growing. Uh, at least that was the case for most of the time until it wasn't. But I'm getting ahead of myself. Let's go back to talking about code stuff. So in Beat Saber, there is this environment system so that as you're playing the game, it's not just blocks in like a dark room, right? There's lasers and track lighting and rings. This is a screenshot from the game. And you'll see that there's these, there's all kinds of different lasers. There's these triangular rings that exist and you have control over all this stuff. And it's also map specific. So every map includes custom lighting so that you can synchronize the lights with what's happening. So if you have a buildup, the lights can get really frantic. You can control the speed of certain moving lights. You can control the intensity. You can fade them in and out. There's a total of three lasers, a really bright light you can use selectively, track neons, which are on these big rings, and then two sets of rings. All right, so let's go back to my editor. You'll see here that I have a separate tab, and this tab is for events. I took a lot of inspiration from MIDI editors. So the idea is that each of these tracks is a different event system, and then on the track, you can place individual lights, left click places them, right click erases them, you can toggle between different colors. There's also an edit mode where you can draw boxes to very quickly delete items. There's an undo redo system. And the idea is that behind this, there's a preview of what the lighting looks like. So if I play this part, it's not the most helpful preview because it's kind of hard to see. So I also created a preview tab. And the idea with this is that it simulates what the game actually looks like as best as it can in terms of lighting. So that's the lighting editor. And I had problems with this. And to understand those problems, we have to talk a little bit about post-processing. The idea with post-processing is that after you've placed items and drawn a scene, it's the ability to process things as kind of a static image. So you might imagine like a film grain or a sepia effect as a form of post-processing. It's not post-processing in the sense of it's being done, like it's still being done in real time. It's not like you're exporting something and then doing it in a separate. It's just that after you've drawn the object for every frame, you're gonna do some processing on it. So again, here's a screenshot from Beat Saber, the video game. And then here's a screenshot from what my editor looked like initially. And you know, obviously it's never gonna be perfect because I'm not trying to make it look perfect, 
but there was something definitely lacking. And the problem is that my lights weren't actually lights, they were just rectangles, right? Or shapes. And a real light has this glow effect, right? Like you see the effect of the light seeping out from the light. So the solution I was looking for is called Bloom. And the idea with Bloom is that you take your flat shape and then you blur that shape and then you mix the two on top of each other. So here I have a flat line, a blurred version of that. And when you put the two together, you get this kind of effect. And it's a pretty remarkable effect, right? Like here's the initial one and then here's what it looks like with Bloom. It's also important to use selective bloom because like if I go back to this screenshot, I want to blur the lights, but I don't want to blur the rings or the platform, right? There's all these things that I don't actually want to blur. It needs to be selective based on the layer. So let's look at how we do this in code. And the first thing I want to pause on is you'll see I'm importing all of this stuff from 3.js. What's really cool about React 3 Fiber is that it isn't starting from scratch. There's this rich ecosystem with 3.js and it's years and years that people have been building things and collaborating. And you can leverage all of that in your React app now. So this is all created for 3.js, but I'm able to use it in my React app. So I have a new component called Bloom. It takes a bunch of children and this is going to be the children that it blooms. I'm gonna import a bunch of stuff using the use three hook. So the current renderer, the camera, and the uh, canvas size. I'm gonna create a ref for a new scene and a composer. I'm gonna have a use effect and just quickly to show you, this is only going to happen on mount. We don't actually want this to run on every update, but on mount, I'm going to create a new effect composer. And the idea with an effect composer, it's using the word compose in like the functional programming sense. So it's like a pipeline. It's like you're going to have one effect that feeds into another, which feeds into another. You can have a whole string of them and they just daisy chain together. And effect just means that it's some sort of post-processing effect. So the first pass that we have is a render pass. And this just feeds the output from the scene to be processed. So this doesn't have any effect other than to give you the output of what's currently being drawn. Next, we need our bloom pass. So here we have the Unreal Bloom Pass, which is a form of bloom inspired by the Unreal Engine. I haven't looked into what it does. I imagine it's a fair bit more sophisticated than the bloom example I described earlier, but presumably still based on the same principle. So I'm gonna pass it a bunch of arguments that it needs. I don't remember what these numbers are, but the internet provided them for me. Um, there's configurations you can do to set the threshold and strength and how much exposure you want it to have. And then I'm going to add this pass to my composer. So now the composer is starting with a render pass and then it's gonna have an Unreal Bloom pass. Next, I have another use effect so that whenever the canvas size changes, I change the size of the composer so that if the user resizes the window, it applies the effect to the same amount of space. And then I have our use frame hook, which we saw earlier, which lets us hook into the render loop. And we're going to call render on our composer to run these effects on every frame. Next, I just render a scene, capturing a reference to it with the children. And to understand what the children are, we'll see how we use this. So here I have uh, you know, the main part of my application. I have a bloom effect, which takes all of the lighting as children. And these are just custom components I created. So I have two side lasers, a left one and a right one. I have our back laser and our primary light. And then I also have a no bloom, which just does very, it's a simpler version of what we just saw, but it skips all the effects. And it's gonna take our static environment, the ambient lighting, which is just a general lighting applied to everything, as well as our two sets of rings. All right, let's go back to my story about community. And I will warn you now, there is a Rick roll coming. So even though I thought Mediocre Mapper had a lot of usability issues, it remained the most popular editor by far. Beatmapper, I would say, became like the second most popular editor, maybe, but like distantly second. Still far and away not what most people were using for editing their maps. But I was happy with this. I wasn't trying to build the most popular editor. I was trying to build an editor for myself, and I, you know, I got a bit of a kick out of other people using it, and liked the idea of it helping people make maps. But then something happened. The owner and creator of Mediocre Mapper decided to blow it up. And he did this thing where Every time you open the software, it would play whatever this Rickroll song is. And it would continue playing on a loop at maximum volume with no way to turn it off. And you can imagine if you're trying to edit a map to music, this renders the editor completely unusable. The reason he did this, right? The reason that this happened was that he was sick of dealing with the user complaints and the feedback and the bug reports. He too was also just trying to make an editor for himself and he didn't want the burden of having this number one editor. So he broke it intentionally for everyone in the community. And what this meant was that everyone immediately migrated to my editor. 
And, you know, you saw this moment where the traffic just went way up. And all of a sudden, my inbox started getting filled with user complaints and feedback requests. This was a nightmare. <laughs> like, I didn't want this. I was happy with my quiet existence. And it made me worry, right? If the community drove this person to doing this, was my mapper next, right? Would I have to do the same thing with mine? Okay, let's talk about file management for a little bit. So BeatMapper is 100% local. There's no backend server other than using Netlify as a static web host. And the reason for this is two reasons. The first is that it's very common for people to create maps out of copyrighted music, right? Like there's not a lot of people making maps to public domain music. And I didn't want some server that would store all of those pirated songs. I didn't want BeatMapper to secretly be like a file sharing service that people used an underground method to pass pirated music around. The other reason too was just costs. And when I say costs, I both mean pricing, right? Like money, because I'm going to have to store these files somewhere and it's going to cost me money to serve them, but also time and energy, because the moment you have a backend and a database, you have to maintain those things. And I just didn't want to have in like six months to deal with like something being deprecated. I wanted to reduce the amount of time in the future I would have to spend maintaining things. And the easiest way to do that was to have it be front end local only. But this presents a challenge, right? How do you store and retain access to files that are all local? Specifically, what I mean is that in a normal application, you would select a music file in your computer. And then if you close the application and reopen the application, it would still be linked to that file on your computer. But you can't do that in the browser. In the browser, the only access the browser has to your file system is if you click an upload button and you can select a file, but then that link is temporary. And if you close the browser and come back, you can't have access to the user's hard drive. And this is done for a good reason, because you wouldn't want a website to be able to like crawl through your downloads folder and like secretly access your files. This would be a privacy nightmare. But it does mean that it presented a challenge in my case. So I thought about what I could do, and I investigated a few different options. First thing I looked at was there's this file system API. And the way that it works is that it gives you a virtual drive. So it's sandboxed from the rest of the computer. It essentially reserves a certain amount of space and it pretends that it's a drive. So you can create files and directories, but it's totally detached from the user's actual hard drive. And while this wasn't really ideal for my use case, it was totally workable. Except then you realize that this API has been deprecated since 2014. Chrome introduced it, but none of the other browsers picked it up and it still only works in Chromium browsers. And the future is very bleak for this API. So I kept researching and I found something called the Writable Files API or the Native File System API. And this is like perfect for my needs because it does give you access to a portion of the user's hard drive, but it's very much based on permissions and it's done in a very secure way. But this doesn't actually exist yet. <laughs> it's like proposed and there's an early trial happening but there's no estimated date of completion. So this is not an option today for me. Turns out that the solution was everyone's favorite IndexedDB. And it's not meant to store files. Um, it's not actually meant to be used as permanent storage at all. So it's very much not ideal for my use case, but what choice do I have, right? It's, it's what I have, so I have to make it work. And the way that it works is that whenever you select a file locally through that upload button, I store it as a blob in IndexedDB. So I treat it just as binary data the same way that I would treat any other form of data. And I'm able to read from it when you come back next time because it's IndexedDB. So I had that worked out, but then I had a new problem. And the problem is that when you edit a map, it's not just one file because you have your song file. Every song or every map has a cover art. There's a main configuration file, which is stored in JSON, which contains information about the BPM and all that. But then every difficulty also has its own file that contains the placement of blocks and lighting events. So it's not uncommon to have like seven or eight files for a single song. So the problem is how do I send the user all of these files, ideally in like a zip file? And happily, there are two tools that I found that solve this problem for me. The first is called JSZip and it's absolutely amazing. It allows you to zip and unzip files right in the browser. And the second is File Saver. It allows you to save as even if you're saving something that was generated dynamically on the client. Conveniently, these tools also let me import maps. So if there's a map you really like that someone else made, you can download it and import it into BeatMapper and edit it or build on it. And the way that I do that is I uncompress the zip in the browser. So you select the zip on your computer, I uncompress it, I store the blob in IndexedDB, and then I rezip it when it's time for you to download. This wound up feeling like I was duct taping a lot of different tools and services together, but ultimately it accomplishes the goal. And it allows me to build something that feels an awful lot like a desktop application all in the browser with no backend at all. 
All right, so back to my story. Beatmapper very quickly became the main editor that everyone used. And as I mentioned, my inbox started filling up with complaints and suggestions, but it didn't last long. The reason for that is that fork culture went out. So something I didn't mention earlier is that Mediocre Mapper was not a unique creation. Initially, someone created a mapping piece of software called Edit Saber, and someone forked that to become Edit Saber Enhanced, and then someone forked that to become Mediocre Mapper. Well, it happened again. Uh, someone forked Mediocre Mapper to become Mediocre Map Assistant 2. So it's a fork of a fork of a fork of a 3D Beat Saber song editor. So happily, someone else now has the burden and pleasure of maintaining this very popular editor, and my editor dropped back to obscurity. It gets now between 50 and 100 people a day, um, which is absolutely perfect for me. It's a niche editor, it's used by a few people. Uh, the people that do use it seem to really appreciate it. I hear from them every now and then, and by, by and large, they're super nice and friendly people. I think that there's a very important lesson in this story, and it has to do with these two things. So the first thing is that I could not have made this editor without the amazing tools built by the community. So this includes 3JS, it includes React 3 Fiber built by Paul, it includes JS Zip and File Saver, and a hundred other dependencies that I don't even know exist because they're one or two layers below the surface. And really, I could not have made this without them. If I had just tried with vanilla JavaScript and vanilla WebGL, this never would have happened, right? This thing would not exist. The other simultaneously true thing is that it is absolutely exhausting maintaining software. It's very rarely fun, right? You're dealing with constant bug reports. It's a job that no one is paying you to do, usually. So I think it's really important to be very, very nice to the people that do this work. And, you know, it, I think it's important to be nice generally, but you can do this out of self-interest, right? You don't want the tools that you depend on to disappear because it's gonna make your life harder. So when you're opening an issue on a GitHub repo, really think about the fact that you are asking someone to do work for you and you are not compensating them for it. That's the mentality you should have. Because if you don't, right, if you continue to go about your life assuming that everyone owes you their time, you may find yourself getting rickrolled. All right, that's my talk. Thanks so much. You can visit my website if you'd like to see the code and the slides and all that fun stuff. Thank you. So, Josh, I want to ask right away because um, I noticed you used uh, React Three Fiber in your uh, in your Beat Saber application, and I just actually posted a link uh, again in the Discord chat to Paul's talk with Jason Langsdorf, which can get you up and started with that. But um, when you were using React Three Fiber, did you ever have to drop down into Three uh, JS and and use it? Is there some type of an escape hatch in React Three Fiber? Uh, I don't know much about it, but I thought yeah, it might be a good question. Definitely. Uh, what's cool is that I didn't have to do too much. The, the closest I came to going like under the surface was the Bloom stuff where I had to use Effect Composer. I think that's like the 3JS library has this, like you're creating objects with the big like three object. And I don't think I ever had to use that, uh, maybe like once or twice. But for the most part, the bindings are super like well thought out. So. Uh, like even like there's multiple layers you can drop out of, right? Like you can drop, you can use the escape hatch to get to the three bindings and then three gives you escape hatches to edit shaders directly. And I've never had to use those hatches. Um, nice. Yeah, By the way, the only, sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. No, no you, you go ahead. <laughs> sorry. I was going to say the only other thing I had to do actually, and I, I meant to talk about this, but it slipped my mind is that the actual block shapes, I built those in Blender. I just carved out a little. Yes, and that's block. something we asked him, uh, what it was like using Blender. Um, he said there wasn't plugins specifically, but that you could totally use Blender and create things in 3D model in there and bring them in and use, uh, obviously, 3JS or React 3 Fiber. Yeah, and um, from what I remember that it was a really smooth transition where I was able to just export the thing and use it. By the way, your condo is amazing. <laughs> it's um, a fake background. <laughs> uh, Sadly, <dang>. it's, uh, <laughs> that would be cool, yeah. Um, I think what you talked about with the community is really important stuff to remember. I think we all have to remember that the people behind these um, libraries are regular people uh, like you and me, um, and they put a lot of their time and energy into it, and we need to be nice to them and <laughs> not blow them up. Um, oh, quick question, uh, just because I, I, I'm always amazed by people like you and, and uh, Kenneth, who, who build these amazing tools Hi, with React, like the, he has a beat today. machine, you have this beat saver. Um, how long did it take you? 
I, I'm hoping you're going to say at least months. <laughs> <laughs> it was quite a while. And, you know, like I, I always kind of have a side project going. I have the uh, rare gift that I get up at like 530 in the morning, kind of just naturally. So oh, I have too. like a couple hours in the morning before I start my job uh, where I, I get a lot of this stuff done. But yeah, it was like several months. And I think uh, there was a holiday or something that I was able to get a good chunk of this. on. Maybe the Christmas break last year or something like that. Cool. Well, I just did want to uh, mention one more time that people can check you out at joshcomo.com. That's where your blog is. I uh, hope I got your name right there. Um, I, I know you, so I hope I got your name right. Um, you did get and, the name uh, right, but the blog is joshwcomo.com. Is it? Oh, yes, you're right. I see that here. I'm very sorry. So, it's a French um, name, right? Yep. You very cool. Of French? A little bit. I mean, I live in Montreal. It's a French city. And I have uh, yeah. some so you French got know a little in, bit. My, in my lineage, but it goes back a few generations. But one of the things that I'm always amazed with with you is uh, some of the really cool animations and how good you are with animations and the smoothness and subtlety of them. So there, you can check out his blog, toggle the light and dark theme. You can see some subtle ones, or you can subscribe to his new letter, his newsletter, and see you know one that's not so subtle. But <laughs> again, amazing blog, and I hope to um, I hope maybe one day you you do open source it, even though it's closed source now. But, uh, and I'm also looking forward to, oh, there was an, another blog that you said you're doing soon, I think on the Venn diagram. Yeah, mm. so uh, looking forward to all that stuff and thank you very much for your talk. I appreciate it, thank you. Thanks, Josh. All right.